Hey everybody, I got another video here for you today, and this is one I wanted to share for a while. I've had a clip that's been just kind of sitting there for a couple months, and I was going to use it in a Randall Carlson video, but I never did, and I just saw it again today. And I know a lot of you like those in search of videos, and this has to do with the same subject matter that uh, Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson talk about as far as what happened on Earth about 11,600 years ago. And I thought it was a pretty cool to just listen to what they had to say 40 years ago on the subject matter because a lot of progress has been made in the study of impact events. But we know for sure they took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And the number one thing I've learned on YouTube, really, and listening to lectures and people talk and podcasts, especially Randall Carlson, is how impact events and things from outer space maybe supernova events, CMEs, and especially impact events, they have affected the course of human history greatly. So, you know, people say, you know, 1908 event, what does that have to do with ancient history? I think a lot, because we can look at this event, and this was a relatively small object that entered the Earth's atmosphere, and the devastation it caused, we can learn a lot because I think we have no freaking clue what an impact event, like if a good-sized chunk hit the ocean, I, I just don't think we have any clue how devastating it would really be. And trust me, there is a lot of mythology based on really cataclysmic times that happened on this earth, and I think that's clear to anybody who reads it. Now, let's go down to Tunguska, Russia, and... Google Earth takes you down to this spot, and obviously there is something here, but I, I don't think any meteor impact site has been found. But this area, you can still see if you go into the forest here, but obviously today, even sparsely populated, nobody died in this great disaster. Now, this is Leonoid Kulik's expedition into the Siberian wilderness. I think about 19 years after the event happened and this was really the first study of what went on here and it was a great mystery and there was different theories written about but the meteor comment of course later on UFO theories about this event and a few others that were pretty uh, far-fetched but still people hold held some credence in them but I thought this was fascinating. And here you see some of the devastation, the trees all flat in the same way, just blown down by a great force. And remember, this was not, by standards, a very huge object that entered our atmosphere, but still blew down hundreds of square miles of trees, burned reindeer where they stood. This was a totally devastating event. And if it happened today, near a populated area, that populated area would be in big, big trouble. But this is some of the actual footage, and these are tree rings, and how there really wasn't any growth around 1908. And this is just a tiny peek at what the area looks like today, and I'll leave a link below. Now, let's just read a little bit of eyewitness testimony that was recorded by Leonoy Kulik on his expedition in 1930, it says here. It says, at breakfast time, and this is the testimony of S. Semenov, it says, at breakfast time I was sitting by the house at Vanvera Trading Post, and that is about 65 kilometers south of the explosion, facing north, suddenly saw that directly to the north, over Ankul's Tunguska Road, the sky split in two, and fire appeared and wide over the forest. The split in the sky grew larger, and the entire northern side was covered with fire. At that moment I became so hot that I couldn't bear it as my shirt was on fire from the northern side, where the fire came, came strong heat. I wanted to tear off my shirt and throw it down, but then the sky shut closed, and a strong thump sounded, and I was thrown a few meters. I lost my senses for a moment, but then my wife ran out and led me to the house. After such noise came, as if rocks were falling or cannons were firing the earth shook and when i was on the ground i pressed my head down fearing rocks would smash it 
When the sky opened up, a hot wind raced between the houses like from cannons, which left traces in the ground like pathways, and it damaged some crops. Later we saw that many windows were shattered, and in the barn a part of the iron lock snapped. Now this is testimony of Chuchan from the Chaniagar tribe, as recorded by I. M. Susloff in 1926. We had a hut by the river with my brother Chekarin. We were sleeping. Suddenly we both woke up at the same time. Somebody shoved us. We heard whistling and felt strong wind. Chekarin said, Can you hear all those birds flying overhead? We were both in the hut. We couldn't see what was going on outside. Suddenly I got shoved again, this time so hard I fell into the fire. I got scared. Chekarin got scared too. We started crying out for father, mother, brother, but no one answered. There was noise beyond the hut. We could hear trees falling down. Chekhar and I got out of our sleeping bags and wanted to run out, but then the thunder struck. This was the first thunder. The earth began to move and rock. The wind hit our hut and knocked it over. My body was pushed down by sticks. My head was in the clear. When I saw a wonder, trees were falling, the branches were on fire. It became mighty bright. How can I say this as if it were a second sun? My eyes were hurting. I even closed them. It was like what the Russians call lightning, and immediately there was a loud thunderclap. This was the second thunder. The morning was sunny, but there were no clouds. Our sun was shining brightly, as usual, and suddenly there came a second one. Chekhar and I had difficulty getting out from under the remains of our hut. Then we saw that above, but in a different place there was another flash, and a loud thunder came. This was the third, third thunder strike. Wind came again and knocked us off our feet, struck the, falling tr struck the fallen trees. We looked at the fallen trees, watched the trees' tops get snapped off, watched the fires. Suddenly Chekhorin yelled, look up, and pointed with his hand. I looked there and saw another flash, and it made another thunder, but the noise was less than before. This was the fourth strike, like normal thunder. Now I remember well there was... Also one more thunderstrike, but it was small and somewhere far away where the sun goes to sleep. And here is a pic of the trees that were down on one of these expeditions. But let me just take you over to that clip from In Search Of. And at first they talk about a meteor crater in Arizona. And they talk about impacts on Earth. And then they segue into the Tunguska event. These are kind of uh, not edited in perfect order, but here you go. Here's In Search Of and Impact Events in Tunguska. Hope you enjoy it. Y'all have a very nice day. Long ago, a huge asteroid weighing millions of tons suddenly, unexplainably, fell from its orbit and tumbled headlong towards the Earth. probably exploded with a force far greater than any recorded nuclear explosion, leaving this crater. Founder of the American Meteorite Laboratory, Dr. H. H. Nininger. The greatest geological force that has ever operated in the crust of the Earth has been the force of impact. We have a little example of that impact here before us today. I say a little one because this one is about four-fifths of a mile across and 600 feet deep. But that is a baby by the side of others that have been found on the earth that are old, that have been wiped out almost entirely by erosion. Originally twice as high and deep, enormous craters have been uniquely preserved by the climate of Australia. Others were blasted out of solid granite one huge Canadian crater is even visible from space. The face of the moon is a clear example of impact. Seen from Earth, its craters appear as tiny pockmarks. They are actually up to hundreds of miles in diameter. It's hard to believe that our Earth's appearance was at one time very similar to the moon's today. What result did this awesome force have during our planet's ancient past? We don't find the North Pole in the past at the same location it is now by any means. It has been shifted as much as 30 or 40 degrees from time to time. 
And the only sensible explanation for that that I can think of is impact. Recent studies have established that our Earth's poles, as shown here, have undergone complete reversal in the past. Evidence of this sudden catastrophic shift lies hidden in the enigmatic vastness of the North Pole. Coral reefs have been discovered here, as well as trees with their fruit and leaves frozen intact. It blasted this crater from the Arizona bedrock. Diamonds were created instantaneously. This computerized graphic illustrates the three million tons of crushed earth and meteor that in less than a second were strewn for miles over the surrounding countryside. One block, the size of a large house, was thrown into the crater lip. Comets, frozen bodies of ice and gas, twice in the last 80 years have exploded into the Russian countryside. Actual footage shows the aftermath of the 1908 Tunguska explosion. Dr. Eugene Shoemaker, world-renowned authority on cratering and recent electee to the National Academy of Science. If an event like Tunguska were to happen today over a populated part of the Earth, that event would almost surely be perceived by the people and by the nation in which it happened as a nuclear attack. It was the morning of June 30th, 1908. At precisely 7.17, the object exploded. The story of that explosion has been passed down through a generation to people who remember it today. Dorothy Raisinen's parents witnessed the explosion. There was this big boom. They couldn't see, and the earth shook under them. And of course, they all fell down and prayed and cried, you know. My children got hysterical. The sky turned kind of a dirty orange, a haze got in there. Technical journals and daily newspapers as far away as California reported that dirty haze seemed to settle on the horizon following the explosion. The blast that occurred in Tunguska was so intense that it knocked people off their feet 200 miles from the blast site. Amazingly, however, there was not one human fatality. Whatever the object was, it struck in Tunguska in the middle of a swamp. What it was, or how it could have caused such massive destruction, remained a mystery. Barographs, a primitive form of seismic recorder, mechanically measured the magnitude of the explosion as far away as London and Washington, D.C., but they in no way adequately communicated the intensity of the event. Nor did the brilliant sunsets, which painted the skies for several days after the explosion. The first successful scientific expedition into Tunguska was not launched until 19 years after the explosion. In 1927, a young Russian meteorologist, Leonid Kulik, set out to prove that the massive destruction was caused by a meteor colliding with the Earth. Kulik's theory was fully accepted at the time as being perfectly logical. After carefully studying the work done by Kulik and other Soviet scientists, a book was authored on the subject by Thomas Atkins. Uh, and also by using some information uh, that he had acquired from uh, a... Uh, a seismic station, an earthquake station in, in Irkutsk in uh, southern Siberia. He manages to, um, to locate, uh, after a rather long and arduous expedition, the, the fall point or epicenter of the explosion. What he finds is a shattered forest. The extent of the destruction that uh, lay before him was uh, mind-boggling. He got up on a high ridge and looked out for 10 or 12 miles. And as far as he could see toward the north, every single visible tree had been knocked down. He gets to the center of this destroyed forest and he finds not a crater, 
but something uh, far stranger and something for which he had no explanation. He found a forest that was still upright, a dead forest. It was here, in the very epicenter of the blast, that Kulik expected to find the same sort of crater that was gouged into the Arizona landscape 50,000 years ago by a giant meteor. thousand feet in diameter and 600 feet deep, the Arizona crater has resisted forces of rain and wind to remain virtually unchanged. If a similar type of meteor had crashed in Siberia, then logically it should have left just such a crater. But it did not. That fact has sparked the controversy over the origins of the Tunguska explosion which continues today. The information on Tunguska is still being catalogued and analyzed. Some modern day astronomers believe, however, that Kulik was on the right track. They maintain that a crumbly sort of meteorite, a carbonaceous condurite, was responsible for the explosion. If we have a carbonaceous chondrite that is 40 or 50 feet in diameter, that's a huge object. What happened at Tungus Ronald Oriti, who supports the meteor theory, is an associate lecturer at Griffith Park Observatory. Uh, it would probably totally disrupt in the atmosphere at an altitude of anywhere from 5 to 10 or 15 miles above the Earth. The energy that it releases at that time is the same energy that would be released by a much uh, stronger object, an iron object, of the same mass upon striking the Earth. So what we find with uh, Tunguska is that we can entirely account for what took place if we have a very soft and crumbly meteorite that explodes in the atmosphere. Most meteors burn up before they can explode. That fact has not escaped the notice of an equally qualified scientist, Charles Cole of Caltech, who supports the comet theory. Comets are basically dirty snowballs. Uh, that is, they're composed mostly of water ice with some dust mixed in. They're very fragile things. They're not solid rocks. This helps explain why the Tunguska event did not leave a large crater on the ground. Even though it was a very massive, violent event, uh, there were no large craters found. This is because the comet exploded before it hit the ground. The blast effect knocked down trees and uh, people many miles from the center of the explosion. But it did not leave much evidence on the ground. There were no large chunks of meteorites left. This can only be explained by the fact that the comet disappeared before it hit the ground, whereas a meteorite would have left a large crater, and fragments scattered all over the place. I think the comet theory is, is the best one, simply because it explains uh, all the facts uh, with the minimum number of assumptions. <laughs> 